All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining. We'll give it a, a few minutes for more to join, and then we'll kick it off with the agenda. Hey, Kieran, are you out there? Hi, Clinton. Yes, I'm here. Are you going to be presenting for Open EBS this morning? Uh, yes, Clinton. I and uh, Jeffrey will share the slides. Uh, uh, they probably take around 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, I will kick it off and then hand it over to Jeffrey for some of the slides. Okay, sounds good. Um, we're going to time box it, so we want to make sure that uh, we get through the slides by about 8.25 and then leave a few minutes for questions so that we can get into the next agenda item at 8.30. That sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Can you uh, see my screen? I've just shared it. Just yep, I think you're in good shape there. Okay. Good morning, everybody. We'll kick it off in about uh, two minutes. All right, this looks pretty good. We got about 20 people, uh, which to be about average for the group. So thanks everybody for joining this morning. Um, we're continuing uh, this bi-week meeting with a presentation from Open EBS. Uh, so trying to share amongst the uh, storage community all the different interesting projects and things that are going on and, and how they relate to, to cloud native. Uh, so there's two, two things on the agenda this morning. One is this presentation, and then the second is to discuss the SWG presence at KubeCon in Copenhagen. Uh, we've actually secured a, a few sessions there and uh, wanted to open it up for discussion for everybody, everybody to figure out you know, what, what we all want to do and how we can work together to, to present some topics to the uh, audience at the conference. So we'll, we'll do that at 8.30, uh, but for now, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Kieran and to Jeffrey to present on OpenEBS. Thank you, Clinton. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Kieran Mowa. I work at Maya Data. I'm one of the maintainers of the OpenEBS uh, project. Uh, so Jeffrey and me will give a brief introduction into the OpenEBS. Uh, just to give a quick uh, snapshot of uh, or like the background of OpenEBS, it was started by Maya Data in the early 2017. It's still under active development phase. Uh, right now we are working on the 0.6 release. What was interesting for us is uh, people were able to resonate with the idea and then um, uh, in the Slack channel of OpenEBS, we've kind of seen people um, say that they're already using it, and some people even claiming that they've put it on production. There's been a lot of uh, uptick in the community activity. Uh, so OpenEBS is kind of tightly related to Kubernetes, uh, like tightly integrated into Kubernetes. So most of my time these days is on the OpenEBS user Slack channel, or sometimes the issues kind of spill over into the Kubernetes, so I'm hanging out in the Kubernetes users channel as well. Kind of understand what OpenEBS uh, brings to the table. It's uh, a simil similar to Calico and uh, Vue. If you uh, kind of 
consider that as uh, an analogy. Uh, just like how they provide network services by containerizing the network capabilities and then use the underlying network infrastructure of the nodes itself. OpenEPS also containerizes the storage uh, uh, capabilities and provides storage service to other workloads at the same time using the storage infra or the hardware attached to the nodes itself. Right. So the uh, main agenda for this uh, meeting is to show you how OpenEBS fits into the storage landscape and then uh, also walk you through a few slides that show how it works at a very high level. And then uh, talk about some of the problems that we are uh, uh, working on at OpenEBS. Uh, we think that these problems are common to any of the other storage solutions uh, uh, that are being worked on with the uh, container environments. Uh, so we'd like to share that and then also accept any uh, collaborations that we can get out of this meeting. Uh, so my reader is the company behind it. Um, you must have seen this mule at the last platform that's where the company was launched. Uh, the primary goal of my data is to work on uh, or like elevate the problems around data management uh, with the focus on simplicity with respect to the uh, managing the storage. Uh, to understand OpenEBS, uh, uh, so I kind of broadly classify the storage solutions out there into these different categories. Uh, and I'm uh, these days thinking mostly in terms of Kubernetes. So most of the terms that I use are related to the Kubernetes. So the different position volume categories that we have out there can be uh, kind of grouped into three categories. The first category or the most commonly used category is the network attached storage. Uh, here, the storage capabilities are uh, coming out of the Kubernetes cluster uh, over the network. Uh, this uh, external storage servers are, you know, uh, something could be like our uh, standard uh, storage vendors, or it could be even, let's say, EBS or uh, GPD. They all fall into this category. In fact, uh, uh, me, Jeffrey, and the uh, team at MyData, we come from the background of developing one such uh, storage server in our past lives, or actually multiple of them in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, in the software defined space and also containerizing the storage itself. So we've been using FreeBSD jails for some time to containerize the storage there. So the other thing that's been uh, making some, uh, uh, or like, you know, uh, find a, kind of finding its way through is the direct attached storage. A uh, lot of enhancements going on in there as well uh, for the simplicity of uh, deployment itself. Uh, but this kind of helps those applications that can take care of some of the uh, replication and high availability kind of uh, uh, requirements. So something in between these two is what we call as container attached storage. Um, uh, there have been different names given to this category, uh, but we call it as container attached storage. Uh, so here, the storage capabilities themselves are containerized. Um, so we call it as container attached because the containers are serving the data here. Uh, they make use of the local storage attached to the Kubernetes and then expose the data back to the stateful workloads. Uh, while the capabilities like uh, replication, snapshots, encryption, et cetera, are taken care by the storage containers. Uh, so the cool thing about this container attached storage is they are themselves for containers, which can be run as workloads in Kubernetes, uh, which kind of uh, removes the management uh, uh, or like delegates the manageable capabilities like any other workloads to Kubernetes. For example, installation of great monitoring debuggability uh, can be used by the same tools that you use to manage your standard workloads. Uh, the containers themselves specifically uh, deal with capabilities of uh, storage management or the disk management and uh, their data protection and high availability aspects. Right. Um, just covered that part there. So uh, to kind of get a glimpse, uh, let's see how OpenEBS is used. Can I ask you a quick question? Okay. Sure. So. Uh, CAS is uh, already kind of an established uh, acronym for content addressable storage. Is uh, is there a reason why you didn't go with software defined storage? Like, uh, why, why did you you choose container attached storage? Okay. I guess it's Right. Uh, so the container attached really comes from the um, source of the storage. Uh, so looking at network attached storage, the net data is or like data is serving over the network. Direct attached storage by the disks directly attached, and container attached is uh, primarily to say data is being served from containers. Um, 
Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I didn't know that there was already an established term called CAS. Uh, I'll take that as a feedback. Thank you. Thanks. So looking at the uh, open EBS uh, volumes in use, uh, so you, it's as simple as uh, starting with any Kubernetes cluster that you have uh, with one or more nodes with some kind of storage attached to it. Either it could be like your um, host disk itself or maybe like additional disks. Uh, so OpenBS uses iSCSI as a way to connect to the uh, storage uh, containers. Uh, so iSCSI initiator is one of the prerequisites or the only prerequisite that we need to have on the nodes. And then we can, or the, the cluster administrator can configure where the data is stored, whether on a host directory or whether on the external block device using CRDs, uh, which uh, are called storage pools here, and then tie it into the storage classes. So that's pretty much the setup part of it. Uh, then you get into the regular workflow of a PVC referring to a storage class. Uh, and then the uh, work starts off, workflow starts by kicking in the OpenEPS dynamic provisioner that will spawn in a storage container, or uh, in this case, let's say it's a ISCSI target. Uh, this is a standard um, Kubernetes deployment with a service attached to that one. Um, the service IP is the one that we use in the iSCSI IQN. And then depending on the policy attached to this particular volume, there could be one or more replicas. The target takes care of synchronously replicating the data to all these replicas. Uh, and then we create an iSCSI PV out of it uh, and hand it over to the kubelet, uh, which takes care of attaching it to the pod and then running the workload. So the next few slides are um, taking from a live example, uh, the different uh, uh, Kubernetes YAMLs that get generated. So this is the PV object where it's a Storage and the PV spec. Um, is is anyone else hearing that same problem with this audio? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I yeah, yeah. cut out there for quite a while. Hey, hey Kieran. Yeah. Kieran, you out there? I, hmm. I can hear you, uh, Clinton. Can you hear me? Yeah, you were just cutting out. So I think when you started talking to this slide, you, you started cutting out a little bit. So it sounds like your uh, bandwidth or something like that's a bit low. So we're not hearing your voice at times. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can uh, switch to some other speaker. Uh, Murat, yeah. can you hear? I don't know if it's a speaker. I, I wonder if, uh, are you driving the slides from your computer? Yes, I am. I wonder if uh, someone else on your team could drive the slides and maybe you can just use your, your bandwidth for speaking. I don't know if that's the problem or not, but you know, we couldn't really make out anything you were saying there for a minute. Okay. You sound okay now, Kiran. Yeah. All right. Uh, should I back up a couple of slides or? Um... No, I think you're good on that slide. But let's give it a shot for uh, for right now. And if we if you start getting interrupted again, we'll I'll let you know. And we'll have to figure out how to, how to okay. drive the slides in a different way. Thank you. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, uh, so the next slides, as I was saying, is all uh, walking through the Kubernetes uh, objects. So I'll quickly run through. Yeah, hey, hey, Kieran. Um, hey, Kieran, you, you're you're so cutting the service out. service IPs. Yeah. Yeah, you're cutting out. So let's let's try this. Um, I think that everybody has the the slides in the the meeting notes. Um, if not, I will post it to the channel right now. Let's try to see if you stop sharing and see if your your voice gets better, and then everybody can drive the slides themselves uh, to follow if that works. Clint, could you share the slides? Yeah, I'm gonna share those in the chat right now. Uh, okay, the, the link is in the chat for the slides, so everybody can follow along. 
Uh, what slide number are we on, Karen? Seven. Okay. Or as an alternative, I can share from my computer and Kiran talk over. Yeah, you can give that a shot. Um, that works too. For anybody else, uh, we're starting on slide seven. Okay, Karen, do you want to give it another shot? Sure. So I'll um, go ahead with the slide seven. Uh, so the slide seven through the slide uh, 11 are really talking about the I2C, uh, the Kubernetes YAMLs that get generated as part of uh, launching a new volume. Uh, so the first one is an open EBS uh, PV uh, that's on slide seven. Uh, and then the uh, IQN portal IP is something that's coming from an I2C target service that's on slide eight. Uh, and this service is really tied into a deployment file uh, that launches the uh, OpenEBS uh, storage controller. So OpenEBS is both hooking into the control plane and it also provides containers for running the storage itself. Um, the images are pulled in from the Docker Hub and the source code for this is available on OpenEBS uh, GUI as well. Uh, the replication also comes from the same uh, uh, images uh, with a different flag and uh, you use again like the Kubernetes deployment, uh, which is on slide 10. The replication factor is uh, coming from the deployment itself and we use for anti-affinity node tolerations, etc. to kind of pin the replicas to the nodes where the storage is available and making sure the replicas are on different nodes. right? And the other thing about the replica is uh, we use the volumes itself to kind of uh, show or like, you know, link where the storage is, uh, has to be persisted. And depending on the policy, it could be like a local host itself. Right? On uh, slide 12, uh, uh, to kind of sum it up, uh, the transparency with which the storage is deployed is what's more appealing to the uh, users. So Ryan is one of the uh, tech evangelists at one of the large enterprise companies. His role is primarily to find storage solutions that work with Kubernetes. And he finds that OpenEBS um, appealing because it doesn't need a separate storage admin to main, maintain the storage infrastructure. Uh, and he's currently running it on eight different uh, clusters with 500 plus nodes. Um, and he's also become a contributor and helping us uh, push the open open EBS chart into the uh, Kubernetes repository. Uh, so then slide number 13, uh, uh, if we uh, is more like an architecture slide, but these days all the architecture slides are like Kubernetes architecture slides. So we start off with all the components that we depend, which come from Kubernetes itself. The primary one being the ETCD. Uh, we use all the configuration objects that are required by the OpenEBS control plane as CRDs uh, in the ETCD. And then when we launch the operator, the main things that are launched are the API server and the provisioner. And one new thing that we are launching is the node bot uh, uh, to deal with the storage management operations on the nodes itself, right? And since these are Kubernetes uh, native components itself, you can use the same constructs like the Kube dashboard or Grafana or Prometheus to monitor and manage these objects. Uh, this is from the cluster admin perspective. And then when a developer or a user tries to run his workloads uh, through the PVC, it uh, launches the uh, open EBS volume pods that we uh, kind of uh, walked through in the previous slides, right? Uh, so that's at a high level, uh, the different components of OpenEBS and how it works. Uh, now talking about uh, where we are uh, focusing on these days, uh, uh, since OpenEBS has been put into use, we are uh, kind of looking at some problems that come in with respect to ISCC PVs uh, uh, from the kubelet, uh, whether it is running in a kubelet in a container or you know, the attached, detached, uh, the stale mounts, that kind of stuff. So. Uh, this is where our, we are kind of focusing more these days to uh, uh, contribute back to the Kubernetes community. And uh, these, I think, are some general problems that can help other ISCSI based uh, solutions as well. The other thing is volume policies. We just briefly talked about the uh, replica, but I think when it comes to storage, there are a lot of things that we need to track as policies. Uh, could be like a snapshot schedules, RPO maintenance, etc. Um, so we're looking at some collaboration in terms of how do we make the volume policies as first class citizens, just like storage class and PVC in Kubernetes, um, open to suggestions and feedback. 
the uh, third hey, item. Uh, yeah. Just a question: What what's, what engine are you using to write bits to disk? Okay, so that's uh, the Jiva here, uh, and uh, that's kind of uh, also uh, from the OpenEPS repository itself. Um, it's uh, the source of the idea came from the Longhorn. Uh, we also have like other engines that are being implemented, which we will talk about it in a bit. Uh, Basan, right? Yeah. What, what's the relationship between Jiva and Longhorn? Uh, so uh, Jiva was a fork from a, a Longhorn, and uh, then we started making enhancements in terms of uh, exposing the iSCSI target on top of it, and then um, uh, kind of hooking it up with the backend storage on the disks. And is that is the long arm project continuing, or did you guys fork it um, because there was kind of major differences, or did you? What was the what is? I'm not sure I understand the if Longhorn is still going or not. Yes, so the Longhorn is still going on. Uh, we need to uh, still kind of uh, uh, fix that part, but. Um, to that point, uh, Jiva is just one storage engine. Um, in the next couple of slides, you'll, we will talk about another engine that uh, also comes from OpenEBS. Okay. Cool. Uh, so I focus primarily on the uh, control plane and hooking into the Kubernetes part, and Jeffrey works on the storage engine, so he will be able to give more details on that one. Right. Um, so the next one is about the uh, storage management with respect to the node pod. Uh, so one of the things that we see is, uh, uh, yeah, there is some work going on with respect to the local PV, but uh, making those persistent storage options available as some kind of a first class objects, just like you know, uh, some kind of a resource is something that's still missing in the Kubernetes. And also how do we uh, dynamically attach and detach to storage engines uh, so that we don't have to restart when, when we use it as a local PV. Um, that's one of the challenges that we are trying to tackle. Um, how do we make it uh, uh, data center aware or like fault zone aware? Uh, I know these are the problems that I, I think as a storage community we are trying to grapple with in independent ways. Um, this is something that uh, we think we all as a storage community could also solve together. Right? Um, some Kubernetes issues that are raised in that regard, and then one of the design documents that we are putting together uh, is uh, linked here. With that, I give it off to Jeffrey to kind of uh, touch upon the question that you raised, Basam, just now, and then also walk through the storage engine related changes. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, all. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, thanks, Kieran. Uh, so, as mentioned, my name is Jeffrey. Uh, just a real quick introduction. Um, I've been in storage for around 10 years. I uh, was actually at a tipping point of my career when I thought that I wanted to get out of storage. Uh, but then, you know, containers rehappened. So, here I am working on storage. Uh, I've done development across the whole stack of storage systems, kernel, user, uh, software defined, and now trying to do, I suppose, the logical extreme of software defined storage, and that is storage for containers in containers. Um, so before we went out and designed a new storage system in containers, uh, we first stopped and, and figured out, okay, so what are the requirements uh, in a containerized environment? So typically, um, storage developers reason from the bottom up, and so we, we really tried hard to invert that, uh, that process, and when we put the DevOps persona uh, central and reason from the bottom down. And while doing so, we noticed a couple of things, and I wanted to go over them uh, uh, real quick. And obviously, uh, one thing that uh, immediately show up is uh, the way that we build and deploy and, and put applications in production has changed a lot uh, over the years. Um, I probably do not have to tell this audience how that works. You probably even know better uh, than I, uh, but it has evolved for sure. Um, so we believe that these, these typical new application properties allow us to rethink certain aspects and can potentially impact the design of the storage system. So we decided uh, rather quickly that we were not building yet another scale out uh, storage system or a distributed file system because uh, I, you know, these systems can be found uh, you know, in, in the stock Linux kernel today. And we did not believe uh, looking at the uh, previous <coughs> properties uh, like scalability native in the application and reliability uh, that that was a necessarily a good fit. And also distributed storage is really hard to develop, um, you know, probably even harder to debug in production. 
Um, and uh, um, so sometimes you actually need uh, special drivers to unleash the full potential uh, of these distributed valve systems. So we wanted to try um, something else. Another thing that we noticed uh, is that the hardware side of things really enforce a change in the way we, we do things. Uh, single NVMe devices uh, can do up to 450,000 IOPS and even a lot faster these days already. So we don't really need to scale out storage nodes to achieve higher IOPS uh, is our reasoning. Um, similar for capacity as microservices typically have a small working set size, um, you know, and, and when you look at it, the container attached storage perspective, uh, the data sets are relatively uh, small. So um, I'm going to slide uh, 18 now and we'll get to it a little bit in terms of what we're doing. So uh, as, as Kieran mentioned, the open EBS replicas are, are pluggable and uh, we like to believe that there is no one file system to rule them all. Uh, for example, a copy and write file system has great properties uh, in general, but not so much if you do a relational database that have their own write ahead logging and things like that. <laughs> um, some databases even want uh, raw disk devices and open the disk device with OData and do everything themselves. So one of the uh, file systems that we're working on uh, is uh, the implementation of the, uh, the DMU engine of ZFS. Uh, I'd like to point out that this is not running in kernel, but in user space. Um, I will go into uh, the problems that we're facing there and the solutions that we're uh, applying to, to uh, mitigate that uh, transformation, to so to speak. But what it allows us to do very quickly next to the properties that ZFS has like end-to-end -end data integrity, encryption, and you know, enterprise class, quote unquote, storage features like snapshot clones and replication is to do uh, storage, uh, storage. motion. Oh, echo, sorry. Um, okay, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, real quick, yeah. just to make sure we yes. time wise here, we're in check uh, like five more minutes and then we'll do questions. Is that okay? uh, yes, I have uh, three more slides, so I'll be, be really quick, really quick. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, uh, a little up. Yeah, so we can move uh, more persistent workloads across the clouds, leveraging the technology of ZFS. Um, so, as mentioned, uh, we're in user space. Um, and, oh, uh, sorry, I'm slide 19, go a little bit too quick now. Um, so, performance problem as we move ZFS uh, to user space and unpeel the onion and only grab the transactional layer of it. Um, Linus Torvald, probably well known to everybody, uh, made a comment that uh, file system user space are nothing but toys. So when we look at the problems in terms of performance, uh, the, the, the performance bottlenecks in user space are the context which copy in, copy out, and in particular uh, DMA transfers. Um, and the other aspect is that we again observed is that with current hardware trends, the kernel actually becomes a bottleneck. So we are kind of reached this impasse where we are saying that, okay, file system user space are toys. On the other hand, kernels are becoming the bottleneck due to these new technologies like 100 at GB networks, NMVE devices, and 3D crosspoints. So um, next slide, the, the solution uh, that we uh, uh, thought up is we completely bypass the kernel altogether, uh, run everything in user space, and uh, basically put all the devices in a container, and uh, we call it the IOC. And in the IOC, we run a specific software that instead of is interrupt-driven, constantly pulls for completion using pull mode drivers uh, and, and things like that. So we basically un end up with a virtual uh, containerized virtual file system to sort of speak. And instead of submitting the IO to the kernel, you submit the IO to the IOC. Um, so the problem then of course that we needed to solve is okay, so how do we change this IO path from kernel to uh, uh, the IOC uh, without rewriting all the software because that will definitely not work. Uh, and the solution for that is that we looked into the uh, uh, um, uh, vHost technology that we borrowed uh, from the virtualization space. So the IOC, among others, can expose different interfaces. vHost is one of them. And uh, um, the replica containers locally on the node connect to uh, this IOC through the vHost protocol uh, using shared memory for read-write. So that makes it zero copy and the event FD to basically uh, kick the other uh, if there is data uh, written to the, the shared memory buffers. Uh, unfortunately, there was no Vert.io SCSI library that you could pick. They were embedded deeply into Beehive, Kiamu, and, and other hypervisors. Uh, so we wrote one of our own. Um, that's just, uh, you can find this in our open source uh, repository. And <clears throat> the trick here seems to be that you need to allocate huge pages and pin them, and then they become suitable for uh, DMA. Um, we're also exploring future work um, with integration with uh, FDIO or FIDO, uh, if you will, 
and in particular the VPP VCL that allows us to do vector packet processing so that the uh, network IO also goes through the IOC. Um, final slide uh, to put it in the picture. Um, uh, this is basically on the left side. This is how it looks between uh, uh, two processes sharing uh, data between uh, uh, themselves through pin shared memory. Uh, I don't think that this is uh, something new other than the fact that we're doing this directly uh, in a container uh, without a hypervisor. Um, and uh, the right hand side is, 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 a, is a trimmed down picture of, of what it would look like on a single node. So you have the uh, IOC that does 100% pulling, then you have the app uh, and the target, which Kieran mentioned, uh, and we replicate N ways, uh, which is all defined in, in YAML. Um, the target writes to the uh, replica. The replica applies adaptive pulling because uh, when we really want to go fast, we, we can't afford the context switches to for EPOL, so we really do this busy looping. Um, if the load is low, we switch back to EPOL. Um, and then we transform to, so to speak, EIO, apply checksums and, and, and put the thing on disk, snapshots and what have you, and then submit the IO uh, back to the physical disk uh, to the vhost layer, and then eventually it boils down to the IOC. So I could not talk any faster than this, keeping in mind that my native tongue is not English. Um, but with that, I am at the final slide, and if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to ask us. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Jeffrey. I, I got a quick question for you. So um, the name, Open EBS. Uh, I don't think I heard much about EBS in here. So how does how's the name relate to the project at this point? Um, well, uh, so the, the, the name uh, uh, was actually based on the fact that it is, uh, um, you know, it, 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 it relates to EBS. So it kind of rings a bell, to sort of speak. The fact that it's open, uh, you know, also uh, speaks for itself as uh, being completely open source. So, um, you know, uh, I, to be 100% honest, honest uh, uh, the name was uh, already there <laughs> before I joined. Um, the, the, it refers to the fact that it is uh, block storage, for one, uh, and it has uh, strict uh, ties to, obviously, how the way, that, uh, the way that we do cloud storage in general. And, it, yeah, it's basically, uh, you know, the elasticity from block storage comes from the fact that we can spin up containers so we uh, get it that way. Um, but yeah, a better reason I would have to uh, come back to you for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, just a question. So, so did I understand that you are dropping the Longhorn based Shiva, Jiva thing and then going to a new backend? Is that, is that the plan? Uh, uh, well, uh, partially. The, the plan is is that we have multiple uh, plug, uh, pluggable backends for which Longhorn is just one of them. Um, and we believe, as I mentioned, that you know different workloads require different uh, type of on-disk formats, to sort of speak. Um, so uh, uh, we will have multiple, and uh, these are just the first two. Okay. And are you planning to support any of the... Uh you know, any commercial or other open source backends? Like um, if there, cluster or, I don't know, pick your favorite uh, commercial one. Yes, we are obviously, uh, well, obviously, we are very flexible in, in the sense that we can uh, integrate uh, uh, with others uh, uh, relatively easily. Um, this is because we have, you know, virtualized the I.O. stack to sort of speak. So for us, it doesn't really matter to what we write. It could be a... Uh, a physical disk. Uh, this was more ended towards uh, local devices, uh, you know, the direct attached, direct attached storage uh, concept. Um, but we could just as easily write to an RBD volume from Ceph or from Gluster or what have you. And so, is the role of Open EBS as a uh, if you're if you're not tied to a specific backend, is the role of Open EBS essentially as a orchestrator of Storage? Um, it, it certainly does a lot of orchestration of the storage, but uh, eventually it doesn't really matter uh, uh, what you do. Eventually you need to write the data to a disk, right? And we give you the freedom to choose what disk that is. If you want to write it to a local disk, then you can use C store. If you insist on writing it to a cluster volume or, or an RBD volume, we will not stand in your way. That's basically the, the, the freedom that we provide. Augmenting, obviously, the capabilities with snapshots and cloning uh, to that local volume. 
right? Mm -hmm. It's just a block device. Okay. Got any other questions out there? So regarding uh, the, the CNCF like foundation, um, as an open source project, are you guys uh, interested in just growing the community around open EBS? Are you interested in submitting it as a project to the foundation? Like how, how do you see the future of the project in regards to the ecosystem? Um, well, actually uh, the reason uh, for for us, obviously, is to have cross-pollination with other uh, open source projects in particular um, and uh, uh, community growth. Um, I, th I think, you know, in, in all honesty, I, I don't mean this in any way to come across arrogant, uh, but we, 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 we are kind of have this organic growth. Uh, so uh, may maybe Kieran has some other things uh, um, that uh, uh, motivate uh, him uh, at a personal level. But to tie in with, with uh, the other open source projects is, is the most dominant uh, reason for us. Or at least for me, maybe Kieran has a, an additional. Uh, so I think you said it right, Jeffrey. Uh, Clinton, so the uh, interest is to basically gather the community to work on some of the common problems. It could be on this project itself or directly on the Kubernetes itself. And yes, uh, the we playing with the idea whether to submit to CNCF or not, and it really depends on the community's interest and whether the community feels that this should be submitted to CNCF. Got it, okay. Great, anybody else have questions? So that, this is Steve Watt. That wasn't like super clear for me, um, but, but I just first wanna say, I'm glad to see you guys out here. Um, I've always been kind of wondering who you guys were and what you were about, so I'm, just very interested to see the presentation and welcome. Um, and uh, so just to, to go back to the CNCF thing, would it be fair to summarize that um, you're gonna pull your community and if your community thinks that becoming a CNCF project is um, in the project's best interest, then that's the path you'll go. But if not, then you'll just keep doing your own thing. Is that right? Uh, so it's not just the open EPS community, but the community that we have on this channel as well. Uh, so for example, six storage uh, and this CNCF work group as well. Um, if the idea is appealing to more people here, uh, we definitely toyed with the idea of pushing this into the sandbox. Um, but I want to hear comments from the people on this call as well. Okay. I think we can definitely uh, follow up with an email thread. So yeah, and, yeah and, and I apologize sincerely for going so fast, in particular over this whole uh, IOC concept and vhost, how that ties in. Uh, um, but yeah, time was scarce. So, so I really did my best to go as quickly as possible. But uh, you know, anybody feel free to drop me an email or whatever and ask questions and, um, and, and you know. And, and I, uh, I thought it was great, Jeffrey, um, and sorry for pushing you guys on time. We, we do have uh, this recording, so if anybody wants to replay it a couple times to hear it all, uh, it's, the main link is posted on the uh, CNCF storage working group GitHub page. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, um, aside from you know, starting a thread for any extra questions or directly contacting uh, the team at OpenEBS, let's, uh, let's move forward. Uh, the next item we have to discuss for the day is uh, the, the sessions that we've secured at KubeCon to discuss, to uh, talk about SWG related topics. Uh, ben, are you out there still? Yep, I'm here. Cool. Uh, any, any preference on, on how you wanted to, to proceed here? Uh, I was thinking about just opening up a, a discussion. Uh, you know, we have two different public sessions to do, and then we've got one private that we could do optionally. And um, I'm just, I guess I'm just curious to hear everybody's ideas on what they think they should cover. So I don't know if you had any way you want to cover this. No, nope, so that's exactly what I was thinking as well. Okay. Something I wanted to call out was the Kubernetes storage SIG um, has one intro session that's going to be at the exact same time. Oh, wow. um, that's going to be an issue because I know there's a little overlap in the folks that want to attend. Wow, okay. That's the same as uh, a <laughs> KubeCon North America, I think. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's not ideal. 
and so, so um so. one thing i did notice we uh for storage sig we only signed up for an intro session not a deep dive um and it looks like for the cncf work group there is both an intro and a deep dive maybe we could offset it uh such that storage sig does an intro session during that time slot and the cncf work group does a deep dive and that way you have two separate sessions that the same set of folks can attend yep let me take that as an action item to go back to the conference team uh, the committee and see if we can reschedule the the intro because okay. i think ideally it'd be great to have you know more storage sessions at the conference and less i think so if we could get them to move it that would be cool yeah uh, but i agree that we definitely shouldn't be overlapping that's that's not ideal so let me go back as an action on that to, to talk to them about it. Cool, thanks. All right. So, so considering that we, we've got these three sessions, maybe we should start with this face-to-face uh, because -face, uh, I think that is a little bit questionable. Uh, we secured this at 8.20 uh, on Wednesday night, I think, 8.20 to 9.40. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, timing-wise it makes a ton of sense. I'm kind of curious to hear what what the team thinks about that, whether we should uh, uh, cancel that session or whether we're going to have enough people interested in and in, in enough stuff to talk about at that time of night. What do you think? So is this like a, a session in the KubeCon EU catalog that there's an 8.20 p.m. session? No, this isn't in the books. Uh, this is a you know, internal face-to-face -face that we could decide to make public or not. Uh, it's okay. just a, a room that's reserved for us at 820. Um, okay, so just like the one at KubeCon North America, it's like a, it's like a, a place where we can all go and uh, um, debate excitedly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that one was published, though, in the catalog, and this one's not. But yeah, it, it could be similar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you're just polling to see who would turn up? Yeah, I mean, it, for one, it, you know, would anyone even show up to it at that time? Uh, and do we, is that of interest to spend time face to face for the hour and 20 minutes to, to talk about stuff? Uh, or right. 30 PM is pretty darn late. <laughs> and, and, and if we have the other two sessions, is that going to be sufficient for discussion? Yeah. You know, my, my experience on like these face to faces, at least with the Kubernetes story sig is like what, um, we do is we get a couple of topics that are just too meaty to uh, we need a high throughput conversation and then we schedule those for the face to faces. So, and then they're often like so exigent that like we'll make time to discuss them. And so I was curious, do we as a working group feel like there's some really important topics that we need to talk about in face to face? I, I'm not sure. I, I think that, you know, the, the TOC is still figuring out, you know, I think the, the guidance for us, if you guys heard on the last TOC call, uh, the serverless team, you know, put out their white paper and uh, Alexis was asking the TOC, you know, what they thought of it and if that's what they want the SWDs to do. And, and I feel like short of that guidance to us of like, hey, go, go start working on this white paper, go start working on these definitions that um, we may not have meaty topics quite yet to cover. Um, I guess that's my, my thoughts on it. What about the rest of you? I, I think it'll be useful to have a couple of topics and then decide what we, what we want to cover in the, in the face to face. Um, so maybe we can, maybe we can have that discussion first. So I, I agree with Steve on that. So it sounds like you, you'd, you'd go to it the song. That's what I'm hearing. Go to it, yeah. If, if, we have a, if we have a couple of topics we want to cover, and, and then I, I would definitely go. One, one topic that I think is a high throughput conversation is like getting to the, the, the bottom of, like I don't think we actually closed on the whole when we say CNCF storage work group, what are we referring to? And um, I think we could, we could have a debate on like the, where the line is between application persistence and storage mm -hmm. uh, and, and what exactly, you know, is the scope that, that we're going to be tackling in this work group. Right. I, I wonder if, um, I wonder if we could get 
Alexis or, you know, multiple members of the TOC to come talk to us and discuss that exact topic. Uh, you that know, would be useful. Ben, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think it's very possible. I think Brian Grant would probably be interested and um, maybe we might be able to get Alexis as well. Hmm. Uh, so I'll write that down to you. So I think you're asking, hey, you know, what's the, what's the SWG? And then I'll, I'll write down another action to, um, to talk with Alexis and Brian about joining. Yeah, because I mean, I think um, if, I, if I just back up, like, I know we said to the, um, the TOC, like, look, we're going to help, like, disambiguate the storage landscape. And um, perhaps naively, I thought that was kind of a simple thing um, because um, I was just trying to disambiguate what we had there, right? Um, and then what it did is it surfaced up this broader conversation of like what is storage in the context of cloud native. And the, you know, and then and I was naive about it because essentially we, we haven't had this problem in the Kubernetes storage SIG, although it could have just as easily have manifested there, which is, you know, what is the focus of the SIG and it's the storage primitives. So I assumed that was the same thing here. Um, but I think as we saw, there's varying opinions on, you know, that. And I think regardless of like the taxonomy, we've got to figure out at like what level of the taxonomy is our scope because we can't fulfill on all the stuff we promised to the TOC around, you know, writing this landscape white paper and like, you know, doing the rest of the stuff until we, it's, it's in the critical path. I, I think there's, you know, multiple work streams that are kind of going on that, that impact that as well. Um, you know, the, the TOC is considering reconsidering the, the definition um, in the charter of cloud native, which I think in, you know all of the projects and the positioning and the work groups and how they think about things so I feel like there's there's some fundamental changes that are happening which essentially you know we need to build upon and and you know the definition of cloud native storage and all that stuff like comes from that work so I'd be really interested to hear from like Alexis and team in KubeCon in in three months you know where they're at with that and then um, what their thoughts are on the SWG and what their thoughts are on the scope of the SWG, exactly as you're saying, Steve. Okay. So I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, anybody else have any, any comments there or, or things that they think should be covered at that, that face-to-face? -face? 